The Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Land Trust. Did you know sportsmen spend over $5 billion annually in hunter and angler access fees? Land Trust is a platform that connects sportsmen with farmers and ranchers like you who have untapped profits just by providing access to their land. Go to landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to see how much you might add to your bottom line. Greetings and welcome to another great episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason, reminding you to check this out wherever you get your podcast, share it with your friends, agricultural and non-agricultural friends alike. And also remember that it's not just an audio. You know, we get thousands and thousands of listens through SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, but it's also a video. So if you want to check out some of my videos, the other videos I create, agricultural commentary, my other podcasts, et cetera, go to the Damian Mason channel. It's Damian Mason channel. Uh, on YouTube. We have an excellent episode for you today. We are talking about a new crop, something you probably haven't heard of because I had not heard of it. It's camelina. Camelina, is it the new canola? Is it a cover crop only? Is it going to be the answer to an oil seed that we've been looking for that has a different sort of set of benefits that we don't find in canola or soybeans or sunflowers? More importantly, is it going to be the answer to our materials issue? You know, we spend a lot of money buying plastic. In my book, Food Fear, I talked about, uh, you know, of all the epidemics that the media loves to carry on about, we sometimes forget that in America, we throw about 230 pounds of plastic per American per year into the landfill. And that stuff sits around for a long, long time. So this new crop, this oil seed called camelina, it could be just an oil seed. It could be in fields near you that you're driving down the road in a few years and you look out and say, what the heck's that crop? Or it could be the answer to our solid waste problems. In any case, I found out about this and I thought this is something I want to share with my good people here at the Business of Agriculture. I've got Dr. Oliver Peoples. He is with a company called Yield 10 Bio. That's yield, like meaning you yield how many bushels out of an acre, 10, the number, Bio. Yield 10 Bio is the company. He's uh, pioneering something that I have not heard anything about until I came across him and his company. And the product is called Camel. I'm sorry, the crop is called Camelina. We're going to hear all about him and what great things they are doing in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Dr. Oliver Peoples, welcome to the Business of Agriculture. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your listeners. Okay, and I'm going to start right off, as the listeners may have already, you know, discerned when they heard you, you are not speaking with an accent from Eastern Iowa. It's from the north of Great Britain. It is from Scotland. He is a Scottish guy, and he uh, came to the United States of America to attend a a place called MIT. You've probably heard of it, prestigious university in, in Massachusetts, and he was working in materials, basically biologically oriented materials. They came across a thing. So give me some quick biographical information. Take me from, from Scotland to here to the career path you're on, sir. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, you know, it's been an interesting journey. So basically I, I, I came to the U S to, to MIT, obviously as a, as a, as a young scientist, uh, just by luck, I happened to be working on a specific project, which, which happened to be the first step in, a, in a, a set of reactions necessary to produce a natural material, a natural polyester, which happens to be a bioplastic. Now, I had no clue what this was until I came across a patent application by a European com- company that was trying to produce this bioplastic by fermentation. And having found the first step in, in, in the system for producing this, as a scientist, I went looking for the next two. And that literally was the last scientific accomplishment I had. <laughs> okay, bioplastic. Um, so the stuff that we generally think about is derived from petroleum products, and that's the stuff that stays around in landfills for thousands and thousands of years. We in agriculture talk a little bit about using soy product to make resin, but it's never really caught on that much. So kind of tell me about the, the this pioneering field of bioplastics that you worked yes. on. So there's a number of these different types. And so, so there's, I think the type that some of your listeners may be fully familiar with is, um, is NatureWorks, which is the Cargill joint venture that produces the polylactic acid, PLA, or NGO family of materials. They are essentially compostable in an industrial compost location. The plastics I work on are natural polyesters. And because they're polyesters chemically, even though they're produced using biology and using living systems, they actually can be processed in plastics equipment to make 
you know, molded items like cups and spoons and forks and all these things, as well as things like films and coatings and many other types of plastic articles. The difference, obviously made from biologically from renewable resources and two, they're 100% biodegradable, just like wood. I mean, if you put a fence post in and it's not treated in any way, you know you're going to have to replace it because it's going to degrade over time. Right. These materials are very similar to that. Okay, so there you are. You're uh, roughly my age, I think. Um, you're, you're over here. It's the 1990s. You're working on this stuff. And then um, fast forward me to today. So your background, you called yourself a genetic engineering or biochemist, I think is the right word. Um and you're working on stuff, um, bioplastics. And then how did it now become sort of an agricultural related thing? Certainly bioplastic would mean that it comes from the earth, but uh, tell me how it got into this and then, and then bring me to, to Camelina. Yes. So when you look at biology and you, and, you, and you ask the question biologically, what's the most cost effective, scalable way of producing a lot of stuff? It's obviously, if you think about the corn harvest or the canola harvest or the, or, or the soybean harvest, where we produce maybe 90 million acres of corn and soy each, and, and you think of 200 billion pounds of, of vegetable oil per year globally, obviously very cost effective and very scalable. Mm-hmm. That. So we have this material that, that, and I think you mentioned this earlier, if you think about plastics, we're talking about an enormous market. We're talking about 700 plus billion pounds of new production per year, growing at so roughly 4%, so 700, 750, you know, it just continues to grow. And and you mentioned the landfilling is is where we think this is going. Unfortunately, that's actually, that's not the worst problem. The worst problem is this leakage into the environment where you see plastic waste everywhere. And as you mentioned, it doesn't go away. So, but the scale is very large and the cost effectiveness of that technology is, is, is terrific, which is why it's been so successful. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to marry up, marry up this biological solution with a low cost, large scale production technology based on this oil seed camelina. Yeah, so um, we got this issue. We're using a boatload of plastics. You know, my own listeners, my own, they're listening to this right now. Uh, many of them are, let's say they use chemi- chemistry. Uh, and then everybody flips out that we're spraying chemicals on these fields. And you tell them it's like the equivalent of a pop can worth of, uh, of chemical on an acre. It's really not that much chemistry. And we're really judicious about its use. What you should be more concerned about is once we use that jug, the plastic, where the hell does that plastic go? Because really, we don't um, we don't prioritize that as a society about its recycling. And as you said, it's not clogging up the landfill necessarily. It's just that plastic never goes away. And so it's leaching, as you said, or ends up in the ocean or whatever like that. So we got this demand, or we think you and I, that there's a need for, and will eventually be a demand for bioplastics. You, uh, you came across this thing or your company did tell me about then moving into the usage of camelina. Because we've already got we've already got soy soy that can make plastic. Why are we not doing that? And why would camelina be better? Yes. Yeah, so so reason to be better. I mean, soy was soy soy and, and canola and, and, and corn. Those are global export crops, and and they're all currently GMO in the US. But obviously, exporting to Europe in particular is really problematic because of these kind of um, market protection regulations that are really in place in Europe. So I, I'm wait, talking- wait, wait, now we're getting off the deep in there. I talked about that in my book, Dr. Oliver, uh, that um, the reality is they try to pretend that the United- European Union won't allow in genetically modified organisms, genetically engineered crops or anything because of the environmental problem. But the reality is, as you said, what's the real reason? It's protectionism. I mean, it's, it's pure, pure, pretty pure and simple. And, and keep in mind that they, they actually need to buy a lot of uh, feed protein. Yeah. So they buy a lot of sort of, you know, they buy an awful lot of soybean protein from the U.S. And, and they buy that in because, because they need it. Quite frankly, if they didn't need it, they wouldn't buy a thing from the U.S. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the reality of it. So as a company, we kind of gave up on that. But we were also looking for a crop that we could completely segregate from the food space, a crop that would be really designed and built for this purpose to produce sustainable, low carbon, new materials and open up new market opportunities for farmers. And so we reviewed, you know, 10 or so different potentials. 
uh, candidates for this. And, and we concluded back, oh God, 10 years ago, that this oilseed camelina had enormous promise. Uh, and at that time, we weren't even aware of its potential as a cover crop, although that's becoming increasingly important now. So, you know, a decade ago, we started working to transfer the biology that's needed to produce these bioplastics from microorganisms into camelina seeds to produce the, this bioplastic in the camelina seeds. And we had some early success. And like anything that's quite revolutionary, you know, we hit some big hurdles. Uh, but we kept working at it. And essentially, you know, back in 2019, we, for the first time, provided, uh, I would say, you know, some, some press releases around the idea. We had finally found the right way to do this. Uh, it's taken more than a decade, but fundamentally, we feel we're now on the path to commercializing it. And coinciding with all of this is the whole carbon economy, uh, nutrient pollution, uh, you know, the Gulf, of course, has been hammered again this year. You're seeing these dead zones, you're seeing all these dead fish, and nobody, nobody wants that. With the drought in the Northwest, you're seeing the, the, the sort of same thing with algal blooms in many of the lakes and rivers. And so, you know, we need to address these problems in, in, in a very much more holistic way. We've got to look at both ends of the equation, not just the production, but also how do we mitigate some of the impacts of that production, which, by the way, is absolutely necessary. And there's not really a way to solve that. So how do we mitigate that? Wait, 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 wait. Which thing is really, which thing is absolutely necessary? Good production. We all oh, there eat. you go. I'm glad you said that because as much as I hear some of the more outlandish environmental uh, arguments, oh, we should all be vegan. Well, the hell of it is, even if we went all vegan, we still have to produce a tremendous amount of calories. And so this does not somehow mean that we don't have an impact on our environment. In fact, it's it's and this is a lot of people to understand, even if we stopped eating meat, we still would have a hell of a big impact on the environment because we're still going to use a lot of diesel and we're still going to have to you know, cultivate the crops, et cetera. So food production is fairly necessary as long as we want to feed the 7.8 billion people on earth. Uh, you're you're right. Our, I'm all in favor of eating. So that's, that's pretty clear. Yes. Guy. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, the point you were going to make about feeding the, the, the growing global population, that's the other point that the environmentalists and some of these activists conveniently forget. It may be okay for folks in California to want to, you know, buy little tiny lettuce leaves and things for some absorbent price in Whole Foods, but the rest of us are trying to trying to make it through the day, feed the kids, uh, grow our families, and, and get on with our business. Yeah, I talk about the arrogance of affluence quite a bit. You know, I, I live half the year in the more affluent suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm sure that some of my neighbors talk and I hear them say wacky shit. Like uh, we're all going to, you know, everybody should go to farmers markets and whole foods. And like, you realize that a lot of people don't live in the same type of a zip code as you. They do not have the disposable income that you have, et cetera. Yes. So you and I can talk about that all day, but what you're talking about here with this Camelina, and eventually you've got to tell my listeners what the hell Camelina is. Um, you're talking about a, pro a crop that can be a cover crop that has a uh, carbon sequestration and also has a bio uh, material uh, benefit. And also, like you said, it's not going to be in the same realm as corn and soybeans. So I want you to tell me all about that before we do I want to remind our listeners to check out uh, my other new venture I've been involved with since June with a group called Extreme Ag. Uh, you can go to extremeag.farm. There's no E on the front of Extreme Ag. It's just the letter X, extremeag.farm. It's a consortium of high-yielding, forward-thinking, progressive-minded farmers that founded Extreme Ag. They're doing product trials. They're using new practices all kinds of new stuff to uh, on their farming operations. And they're all from different parts of the United States. That's the thing. It's not just region specific. So if you go there, you'll see all sorts of uh, videos and articles, stuff that I'm helping them produce that you can apply to your own farming operations. So go to extremeag.farm and check out some of the great work they're doing and how I'm helping tell their story that you can then benefit from by applying it to your own agricultural uh, business operation. Okay. Dr. Oliver Peoples, what the hell is Camelina? Because yes, I, hey, I've been around farm my whole life. I ain't never seen it. I know, I know all the major commodities, grown a bunch of them, even the oddball stuff like oats. We used to have some, some fields of oats on our property for calf feed. Come on, what's Camelina? Well, Camelina is, is very similar to canola. And canola actually historically was something called rapeseed. 
Yes. Uh, grape seed's been around forever. It was primarily a Northern European crop. Well, another Northern Euro- European oilseed crop is this, uh, this plant called camelina, also an oilseed. So what happened about starting about 40 years ago with plant breeders in Canada, who wanted to develop a source of edible oil for Canadian production, is they started working to breed better nutrition into the canola uh, crop. And that's when canola really became a brand back in, I think, the early 80s. And then along came the sort of advanced gene technologies, herbicide tolerance and, and hybrids. And based on that, you saw canola, you know, really grow from pretty small acreage to I think it's 20 something million acres, mainly Canada, North Dakota, uh, pretty big areas, very healthy nutritional oil. And the protein happens to be particularly good. You know, the protein meal after you extract all, very good for dairy. My, my friend, Ali, you know what? You know, you you're almost like quoting stuff right out of my book because I explained the canola story that it was indeed rapeseed, as you said, a northern European type of a product that we had around forever. The problem was it, it was very highly acidic. So two university professors started pioneering usage of this and, and trying to get the acid out of it. And then I got done with it. They said this would be a hell of an oil crop it's suited for our climate, as you said. North Dakota grows 87% of U.S. production. So generally, it's all produced north of, uh, you know, where anybody even thinks stuff grows <laughs> up, up where the Eskimos live, right? But anyway, they had this product. They said, wait a minute, we can't sell rapeseed. Can't market a product called rape. So they came up with the word canola, Canadian oil, low acid. So camelina, is that the real name or did it use to be called? Uh, yeah, so it's actually camelina. Uh, Camelina sativa, it's also known as false flax. False flax. Yes, and obviously we're very aware of flax and all the health benefits of flax uh, these days. So, you know, it's very similar um, in terms of the oil, that, that, that acid you mentioned in the oil. Uh, Camelina naturally has a lower level of that acid, but that's really not what's exciting about it. What's exciting today is it won't take 40 years to get to the same place because we now have this powerful you know, genetic information, the, the databases of sequence information that were generated. So we know exactly what the genetic code of this plant is, and we have tools for changing it. So knocking out that acid has already been done. Uh, it didn't take decades. It was done in the space of a year. So accelerating the development using advanced tools and taking advantage of the you know much more positive regulatory framework in North America for crops using herbicide genetics that have been approved before in other crops is something we believe can really accelerate the development and industrialization of this crop. So false flax or canola, um, so it's an annual, it's, um, uh, it's an oil seed. Uh, what's it look like? It kind of looks like, um, I would say, a poor flowering canola because the flowers don't open as, as broadly and it's not as, as bright yellow. Uh, but it basically just looks like an oil seed. It looks like a canola field where the, the, you know, the, it's a much paler flower. Uh, it's very similar. I mean, it's, All it's, right. It's, it's and for those that have never seen canola, because it's only grown 87% of it's grown in North Dakota, and, and a lot of people have never been in North Dakota. Um, it's uh, not like a grass plant. Uh, it's also not like a, a bean pot plant. It's, uh, it's, it's got a stem and uh, it's got a flower and then, or the seeds in the head or are they <laughs> are pods? I can't remember. Oh, seed pods. Yeah. Yeah. Seed pods. It's, it's more or less the same. It's like a, it's like a, a sort of a version of canola. Okay. So you said, here's this product that's got a lot of these uh, issues, but it's not being used for any human consumption right now. Yes, and so what's attractive for making a new product is that we have no interest in exporting this abroad, unprocessed. And so we can just ignore Europe, leave Europe where it is. I've never liked Europeans. I mean, I got to tell you, the Scottish people in particular, I was, when I was a younger man, I, uh, I got into a mix up with some Scottish guys. And my experience is I'm surprised that they haven't done a better job of taking over the world because in the US, there's a sort of a, a pecking order and a thing you go through, like you're an asshole. No, you're a son of a bitch. And then you go through this thing until it escalates with the Scottish. You just say, you're a son of a bitch. And then they just come over and start swinging. I mean, it's kind of like, I thought I was in a a brave heart of movie there for a while. So, you know, you you don't want to, you're ignoring those Europeans. I got to tell you, in particular, your countrymen, not particularly hospitable, Ollie, not particularly hospitable. Well, yeah, I think that's why I came here. It's much more (laughs) 
So, so you know, I think what's exciting about it is I think when you, you look at making something like that's bioplastic uh, and you look at using this in, in a, as a really a cover crop. So here's what happens. You know, there's going to be definitely concern in the ag community about being prevented from, from using their current practices and or having to pay for the use of those current practices in form of some form of carbon tax. Yep. Or alternatively, uh, you know, essentially having to sort of lay land fallow and what have you. And, and you'll hear this oftentimes from some of these, um, uh, I would say, activists who want us to all go back to the, the good old days of the 18th century, which, by the way, were not so great. <laughs> and, and to move away from what we're doing today, the reality of it is, is that, you know, we, this land is the most precious resource we have. We should not forget that. The second one is water. And the third one is the farmers. And we have to take care of the farmers. We need farmers. Uh, they're really important in, in, in our society as a whole, because guess what? We need to eat. Not complicated. So when you look at these changing practices or evolving practices or adding in technologies, you need to check a few boxes. One is it shouldn't detract from producing these commodity crops. Number one, that we need so important. They're so important for the economics of agriculture here. They're so important for a robust, uh, you know, cost-effective food, food supply. The second thing, preferably it should mitigate some of the negative impacts of commodity agriculture. It should reduce runoff. It should increase the soil carbon. And number three, you should try to do that in a way that rewards the farmer for doing this. In other words, there's a, the revenue generating harvested seed product from this that opens up new markets for agriculture. And that's what this bioplastic camelina is targeted to. And obviously we have work to do to make this happen. But generally speaking, we are already doing winter trials of this as far north as Saskatchewan. There's not too many things can survive in northern Saskatchewan over the winter. But this plant does, so it's quite a remarkable little plant. So we see potential for that in Canada, all the way down through the sort of the corn and soy belt in the upper Midwest, uh, places like Kansas, where you've got winter wheat, uh, and, and they're looking for you know crops to, to cycle with that. And then, frankly, as a spring crop in the Pacific Northwest, there are lots of opportunity for Cambodia. Okay, so, uh, by the way, I like that you're, you're so fun about rolling with my wise apples about uh, Scottish people. Um, and uh, I, I also appreciate uh, your candor on what this thing really does. Rather than fighting over whether we get it approved in the European Union or whatever, your bigger point here is we got a plant that you believe – we can get behind for the bioplastic meaning materials, which we use boatloads of. Again, I referenced it in my book. We just talked about it. We, we're using more plastic every day in spite of all the, you know, straw bands. Plastic straw bands are like a spit in the wind. It's like, it's like hey, it's, plastic straw bands are like the obese person that goes through the buffet six times and then drinks a Diet Coke. It's like, what the hell are we really talking about here? We're banning plastic straws. They served me a Coke the other day with a paper straw in it and it like sticks to your mouth. It's like, for God's sakes, it's in a plastic cup and I had plastic utensils and a plastic plate, but we don't have a plastic straw. Again, it's the same thing, but you're talking about a real need for a product and you think it's got, um, first off, it's got a great deal of adaptability in its cropping system. You know, it can grow in Saskatchewan or it can grow in Kansas. Okay. That's a whole bunch of acres right there. You think that it, um, it's something that can fit into our current rotation and it, we don't have to change a bunch of our stuff. It doesn't have to be organic. It doesn't, it's just, we just go out, boom, and I can plant camelina in these acres in this field behind my house here in Indiana and it'll grow. Right. That's exactly what we were working on. It's essentially something that would allow you to continue the same robust farming practices that have been so successful based on the GMO technology that's really been tremendously enabling for growers. Uh, same type of technology. It'll be able to plant, be almost be planted counter season. So you're going to get more productive use out of equipment. You get more productive use out of your storage bins. You know, it's really designed to fill that kind of, interim between harvest and processing a soy. We, we plant this in the fall? Plant it in the fall. You see it being planted in the fall here in northern Indiana where my farm is. When, uh, let's say, the corn comes off down the road or the soybeans come off next week, um, and I'm recording this on September 17th, I should say, that way the listener knows what I'm talking about. We'll start, you know, of course, we're harvesting soybeans here in the next week. So mm -hmm. let's say then we go out and we 
plant this camelina? Do we plant it on seven inch rows, 15 inch rows? Is there a cropping yeah, system that you're already looking at? There's a cropping system that's been used fairly routinely. I mean, it's either been just seed scattering or basically small plots, but it's, it's, it's not quite defined just what the right agronomy for that is yet. Obviously, as we bring in sort of, you know, seed operations people to optimize all of that, our goal is to hand the grower a package of instructions that says, yep. A, B, C, D, follow the recipe, you'll see great things. Okay, and then you said there's some other benefits. So then we harvest, we plant it, and then it's not a GMO product. So we can't, we don't have any genetically engineered technology. Like we can't just plant it, spray it with glyphosate, and then go on. That's not that. That's not the kind of crop it is. Oh no, that's all. Be, not necessarily glyphosate, but that's actually being introduced into. It. We're putting that in. We are going to have. It's going to be genetically engineered to where it does have some resistance. Be uh, some, some traits. We will have some stacked traits like we do in GMO corn. Exactly. Okay. And then once I har- and I harvest it with a combine and it's a small seed. So uh, you change the grids and uh, the whole idea is use existing equipment, infrastructure and handling. Okay. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's the goal of this. And then speaking of infrastructure, the one problem I have now, it's kind of like all these people got excited about hemp a couple of years ago. I'm like, I got neighbors that are really good at producing crops. Hell, they can grow hemp, but where do we go with it? Um, where do we go with this camelina seed? Right now, we don't have an infrastructure for it, correct? Yeah. So, so in terms of infrastructure, you know, you can take it to any oil seed crushing facility, and they'll process. It can be processed. So, you know, it's the ABCs, right? The ADM is Bungie and Cargo, right? Uh, so, those are that's where you could go with it. But quite frankly, I think what this brings is an opportunity to disrupt that kind of nice little uh, happy camp they've got there. And, and I think what's really exciting about this is when you start thinking about the future and that this could be tens of millions of acres, and number one, it's totally dependent on the growers. You do think, and it's not going to go into the commodity markets. There is definitely value in here to incent growers to, you know, whether it's co-ops or participation in, in investments, whatever it is, there's ways your, to do stuff for them. Your assessment, and by the way, he said happy camp. That is very polite Scottish uh, professorial talk for oligopoly. But yes, uh, <laughs> so what you're saying is you don't see the big four grain handlers or grain crushers getting into this you, you know, they're going to stick with what they do best. And so you're saying that there's going to be, maybe it's kind of the way like the organic thing started or what have you, it's going to be smaller scale. Uh, me and three of my investor buddies get together and say, Hey, farmers grow us 10,000 acres of this uh, Camelina. We're going to have the processing facility. Uh, we'll put up half the money. If you put up uh, as a cooperative, the other half the money, is that what you see happening in terms of the business structure? Yeah, I think initially we'll probably build the first facility and, and, and contract the growing to really, you know, completely de-risk this for everyone. I mean, and really validate the whole, the whole concept. Once that is done, when you start thinking about, you know, going from, a crop that's you know very uh, maybe a hundred thousand acres today to, to tens of millions, uh, and and where you've got this new component in the seed which it requires an additional processing step, there's going to be investment, and I think that investment is where and the value of the product, uh, and the fact that you're outside of the commodity cycle, will enable us to to incent farmers to a grow the product and b we'd be very open to their participation in you know whether they want to get together and form some kind of co-op to to build recovery facilities or however this would work. I think we need to be looking at those types of options. Ali, is Camelina, one of the things we talked about, you're, you've got an environmental pitch, if you will. And again, we're just talking here straight business, meaning the pitch is this is good for the environment because the bioplastic, the materials that we're getting out of it. You've got another pitch, you know, again, I'm going back to my sales roots here. Uh, the pitch is you don't have to buy new equipment. You can use the existing stuff you have. You're not going to change much of your cropping systems. In fact, this should be could be complementary to your existing cropping systems. Um, you don't have to be sort of better again, any of those kinds of things. You've got a lot of things going for you in the pitch. Right now, the only missing factor is where do I go with the seed right now if I harvest it, uh, meaning that's one of the, the issues. The other one is what is my price? You know, everybody I know out here says, Hey, I've got several thousand acres. I know what my cost of production is. And then I can hedge against that for my risk management a little bit more wild West here with Camelina. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what will happen in, in the early days is, is, is the company will basically uh, provide a contracts for the offtake. 
essential yeah. contract contracted so that the farmer, you know, we need these growers. We we are we're not, you know, you mentioned the big three and my 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 comment about you know the happy campers. You know, quite frankly, the whole idea is the value chain in agriculture has been seriously squeezed down. It's kind of been a race to the bottom just because of the way it's structured. I think with new innovations, new technologies, and a new crop like this, there's a way to do it differently. And so that it's more, much more of a partnership model. I agree with that. So you think the Yield 10 Bio, your company, ends up being the, uh, the, the customer, um, uh, the initial customer until, and then obviously ultimately the customer is whoever wants to buy this, mm-hmm. this uh, oil that goes into these resins and plastics and products and materials. Answer me this. If I wanted to buy Camelina seed, do I have a place to buy it right now? Uh, no, no. I, I would say that would be quite difficult. You could probably could buy it. There's probably some supply around, but it's pretty, it's pretty small. I mean, we are actually looking for, for growers to do pilot work with. Yeah. And that's typically still in an R&D phase. So, you know, we have, we have outreach. We're actually doing a lot of trials all over North, the, U, the U.S. and Canada, all the way down to Georgia. Uh, you know, we are pretty active uh, with this crop. So where, you know, where do you, where do you, what, you, I'm sorry, you mentioned some geographies. Do you, where do you think, where do you think it fits first? You know, I think right now, probably in the Pacific Northwest up into Saskatchewan, Alberta, it, as a sort of a rotation crop with canola and wheat. I think the winter lines are somewhat behind, you know, a little bit later. Uh, we do plan to do more winter trials. We've been doing them for a few years uh, successfully in Saskatchewan. It does get a little easier the further south you move. And so, you know, there's trials ongoing by other company, uh, other groups in, in Minnesota, uh, mm-hmm. Illinois. I mean, th- there's, there's a lot of activity around this crop. I like it. I really do like it because I, I talk about it in my book. I talk about it to my audiences that as we get so amazing at producing your base, your core commodities, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, we can grow more per acre per year. And we are, and we have, I mean, there's the occasional little setback, but the trend line is, you know, going up. And uh, as, as we get to where we're so darn good at it, then there's going to be more space for some alternative crops. And some of these alternative crops uh, satisfy, uh, you know, different, different, uh, like you said, Super flax, fat, false flax, whatever. Uh, Camelina is all of a sudden like, wait, I never thought about this. So I agree that there's a real opportunity here. Carbon. Is there evidence that this Camelina does a better job of, of sequestering carbon than, say, an acre of anything else I might put out? I think it's, it's, it's again, it's, you know, like all things in agriculture, it's always a bit more complicated. And so, you know, fundamentally, growing over the winter, when the other, because what happens is it will actually come up out of the ground before the before the frost sets in, then it lies dormant through the winter and then like, early, winter, like winter wheat, right? Exactly, and then it comes right back up and and you can harvest before. So yeah, so we anticipate it's going to put more carbon in the ground. That's just generally a good thing. The fact that it's there and it's already you know up out of the ground means you're going to have more nutrient retention, less water pollution, and so you know we think those are the cases. But I think the real key to this is this allows you to produce a valuable crop in terms of harvesting. Traditionally, cover crops are simply plowed under, so it's, it's literally a sunk, it's a sunk cost in more than one sense of the word. Yeah. But in this case, the idea is you're going to get a harvest, you'll still plow the straw under before your next crop, but you'll have a harvest, so it will actually generate you revenue. Yeah, and I'm all about cover crops. I've been I've been preaching this for a long time. I'm a former FFA soil judging guy. I was going to be an agronomist. I'm all about that. That you know, uh, right now my land grant university here in Indiana, uh, my alma mater Purdue says that average Indiana acre of crop lands about eighty one hundred dollars per acre. Why the hell are we letting that sit barren to get blown around by the wind, uh, you know, or worse yet, doing fall cultivation? I'm a big, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, proponent of cover crops. And, um, you know, you're talking about a product, a crop here that you plant in the fall. It grows, it goes dormant. It protects the soil all winter from erosion uh, and erosion's forces. And then it bounces back just like winter wheat does. So we're harvesting this probably in midsummer. And then, uh, then we've got another cropping system. They taught me a long time ago, and I remember I'm not the smartest uh, tool in the shed, that um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. we got a lot of things that sound really good about Camelina. Sure. I can see a couple of drawbacks. First off, it still is an experimental phase. Um, is there any drawback that we can admit? 
Yeah, so I think that, that it's, it doesn't have the performance of you know, of the high tech canola at this point. Then it also doesn't have the year. It didn't have forty years of of uh, production behind it, right? Does have access to these new tools of modern biotechnology that allows us to accelerate the implementation of all of that, uh, and it does have the benefit that it. Is, is kind of, you know, it's pretty, it's almost like not only did canola kind of lay the foundation for this, it kind of provided the recipe. Yeah. So you mentioned the low uricic acid, not that. Out. So that, we know what to do. We know how to do it. And we have better tools for doing it on an accelerated timeline. But the real issue is going to be getting really robust agronomy packages so that the grower knows when he takes a seed on board that he's going to be able to grow it and get a good crop out of it reliably year after year. And, and that is something that we have to address. And that's why we're bringing in experts from the industry and hiring them to truly sort of run the agronomy and seed operations. I, I love the discussion because, uh, you know, I'm sure the couple of my naysayers are going to listen to be like, yeah, but we still ain't got it. You know, we're like, not, this isn't really viable production, but remember uh, I point out canola was experimental 40 some years ago. Um, I believe that flax is going to come back. I point that out in my book. Also, I was raised at the end of a flax mill road in Huntington, Indiana. They ain't no flax fields in Huntington. There ain't no flax mill, but there was once in the 1800s. And I believe there will be a return of it. Um, this is really cool. If people want to learn more about this, where do they go, Dr. Oliver Peoples? And by the yeah. way, Oliver Peoples likes to go by Ollie. He's not so arrogant as to make people call him doctor. He did point out that there's a, a, a frame, a sunglass frame manufacturer that's very trendy called Oliver Peoples. And he doesn't want to be confused with that. This is the biochemist, not the sunglasses guy. Okay. If they want to find you or more importantly, find your company, what do they do? Yeah, they should go to our website, yield10bio.com. That's Y-I-E-L-D-1-0-B-I-O.com. And they can read more about the company. And yeah, I'm fascinated by it. Closing thoughts, anything else we got to get out there? Because I want to learn more about this. This is the kind of stuff that I see that's very exciting about agriculture. I can get excited about high yield soybeans or, or you know, uh, grabbing uh, one more pig per sow per year on efficiency. But those are just efficiency commodity production things. This is some new technology, but also some new applications. And that's what gets me excited about this. And, and, and it crosses off a lot of boxes, the carbon thing, the cover crop thing, and handling an environmental uh, problem that we have with all the plastic. So that's why I think that's cool. And it, and it gives producers potentially something that doesn't just make them slaves to the existing um, commodity markets as you were. No, I, I, and I think you, you kind of nailed it with all those comments. And I think that, you know, the challenge for us, obviously, you know, developing crops takes time. Uh, we're a small company. It's only 30 people, grand ambitions, uh, and I think we believe a really uh, exciting story and strategic plan, but we know that's going to take an awful lot of hard work by the team that's here today and, and new members we bring in to actually make this happen. But we're going to make this happen. I'm excited about it. Yield 10 Bio is the name of the company. His name is Dr. Oliver Peoples. Uh, he is my third favorite Scotsman. Uh, I got to say that the, the list is pretty short ever since that mix up uh, on the sidewalk at San Diego, California, outside of uh, outside of a tavern uh, uh, with those three Scotsmen. Um, I think they were sailors even. I'm telling you, man, very unhospitable people you come from. But anyway, you're my third favorite. I got Dario Franchitti, the race car driver, because I'm a big IndyCar fan. I got Scotty, the character in Star Trek. And then I got Dr. Oliver Peoples. So you're my top three favorite Scotsmen. Well, I'm honored by that, by that privileged position. <laughs> Thank you very much for shedding light on this Camelina. I have a feeling, and this is what I'd like to do, in about another 18 months, I want to have this uh, visit again so we can see some results of trials and see where we've gone with uh, the infrastructure development and some actual uh, results. Are you going to do that? I would be, that would be terrific. I'd love to, love to do that. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here, Dr. Oliver Peoples. Thank you. You betcha. All right. Till next time, it's the Business of Agriculture. Thank you for tuning into the Business of Agriculture podcast sponsored by Land Trust. Land Trust partners with farmers and ranchers to capture pure profit from sportsmen seeking new experiences and places to hunt and fish. Land Trust built the platform and does the marketing. You maintain 100% control of access and activities, and you set the rules. There's no cost or obligation when you list, and the next 10 Business of Agriculture listeners who go to landtrust.com BOA are eligible for a gift worth over $2,000.